Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, two reminders, one for our in-house audience, if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin, which is always appreciated. And of course, for those watching online, questions can be submitted at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. We will, of course, post the program on our Heritage homepage following today's presentation for your future reference as well. Hosting our discussion and guest today is Luke Coffey, who is our Margaret Thatcher Fellow in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. He studies and writes on U.S.-United Kingdom relations, but he also focuses in particular on defense and security matters, including the role of NATO and the European Union in transatlantic security. Before joining us here at Heritage, he served as the United Kingdom's, in the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense as Senior Special Advisor to then Defense Secretary Liam Fox. Prior to this, he had worked in the House of Commons as an advisor on defense and security issues for the Conservative Party. His work in British politics followed his service to the United States as a commissioned officer in the Army, stationed in Italy with the Army's Southern European Task Force. Please join me in welcoming Luke Coffey. Luke. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, in particular, welcome to uh, the Heritage Foundation for this event on uh, early morning uh, after a long weekend. So it's very much appreciated. Um, I would also like to extend a, a sincere welcome to His Excellency Ambassador Marme, the Ambassador of Estonia, who has um, joined us today. After regaining their independence in the early 1990s, the Baltic states have been staunch supporters of the transatlantic relationship. Perhaps Estonia is the best example of this. It is a model country for NATO to aspire to in many ways. Although small in absolute terms, Estonia contributes to NATO greatly in relative terms. Estonia is a regional leader in defense. It is only one of four countries inside a 28-member alliance inside of NATO that spends the required 2% of GDP on defense. Estonia has sent troops to Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're not talking about safe places up in the north or the west of the country. I've seen personally seen Estonian troops fighting in, in central Helmand province, one of the deadliest places in Afghanistan. And in fact, Estonia has taken, uh, in terms of per capita, one of the highest rates of casualties of any NATO member. And they've also led the way in some of uh, the threats that we... we um, we mistakenly define as new, but for Estonia, they're very old, such as cybersecurity. Um, as several years ago, they established the NATO Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, and they are truly a, a leader in this field. So why does Estonia contribute so much? I think because as a frontline state that has many security concerns in their region, they would like to be seen as a, a, a net exporter of security as opposed to a net importer of security in the hopes that if someday something might happen and they need NATO and they need the United States to come to their assistance, we would do so without hesitating. But it's not just with defense that Estonia is a leader. In terms of economic freedom, Estonia is also a beacon for the region and for Europe. Estonia ranks second in the Eurozone and 11th in the world in the 2014 Index of Economic Freedom, published jointly by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. Proof that pursuing policies of economic liberalization and growth work. The Heritage Foundation has been a long supporter of Estonia. And this is why it's an honor to have you, General, here today to speak to us. Um, General, Brigadier General Keeley uh, is the commander of the Estonian Defense League, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about this organization. But this is a volunteer military national defense organization that could be used, that can be called up and used to help defend the territorial integrity of Estonia if, um, if required. I think probably the closest thing we have here in the United States could be maybe the National Guard or, or, the, or the Reserves, but I do think it's a, it's a unique organization. Um, General Keeley has a very impressive military career, which I don't have the time to go through today, um, but he is no stranger to Washington, D.C., having served here previously as Estonia's defense attache and also being a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. 
So it is an honor to host General Keeley today. He will speak, uh, give his presentation, and then we'll have some question and answers and uh, wrap it up uh, around uh, 11 o'clock. So with that being said, please join me in welcoming Brigadier General Keeley. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me here. So the, uh, and I, I admit, it's the uh, coming back, it's, it's the, uh, it's not the first time for me to be in the Heritage Foundation. However, I've, be, I've been here in the different capacity, literally uh, changing the positions with you. I've always been a, in the Heritage Foundation as the audience, but this is my first time to, uh, to speak and, and talk about. But uh, before I go to my main topic, or the topic of the day, and that is the Russian and, uh, and uh, Russia as such, the, uh, yes, I'd like to explain a bit and uh, elaborate what the Defense League is all about, because that's largely connected to the uh, to the our neighborhood and uh, to to the, the security situation in Estonia. Uh, Defense League, it's voluntary organization, and I mean it. It is a voluntary organization. It's the uh, just the uh, normal citizens, men and women, joining the. Uh, the Defense League in order to protect our country. What's the difference? The uh, difference is that these members are not paid for their service. They are weakened citizens, or they're weakened soldiers. However, many of them, instead of being paid, they contribute to the, uh, the security. Some of them enhance their equipment. Some of them even uh, uh, buy their ammunition on their own. And um, this is also a truly a uh, comprehensive uh, organization, meaning that literally we have uh, members from each and every sector of the society, and each and every uh, profession in Estonia is represented. That, in, it, in turn, uh, makes the organization quite vital and uh, quite a uh, multi-purpose. So we have engineers, we have uh, plumbers, we have uh, doctors, Everybody has their own place, and uh, as a matter of fact, we try to utilize their civilian skills uh, as well as uh, uh, teaching them some military skills. Now, the, uh, going to, to the main topic, the Russia, and I promise I'm not going to show you any PowerPoint presentation because that's... <laughs> I, I, uh, that's something I learned in the U.S. Army War College. That's the death of the uh, in, uh, uh, attention. But um, you know, the uh, I admit, since I lived uh, some of my adult life also on the other side of the uh, Iron Curtain, some of my perceptions could be biased. But that's fine. We all are biased. So the. Uh, Nobody is perfect. However, I tried to approach that uh, topic from a neutral or impartial uh, perspective. But you will judge yourself whether I'm uh, biased or not. And I'd rather have it trying to understand them, trying to elaborate the, the uh, core reasons, trying to present a, uh, some of the uh, findings and uh, the way of the, the thinking, uh, of, of the, the, the society's thinking. Of course, we cannot avoid uh, talking about the current president as well. So some of it, uh, later during my presentation, I will elaborate uh, a Mr. Putin and, and of course, I also admit we cannot get into a man's head. We don't know what his childhood was. We don't know his, really, uh, his real ambition, but we can perceive, we can foresee, or we can really uh, um, prognose. So, the, in order to make a uh, working uh, strategies, one needs to know 
the opponent. Even the, you know, the, my, one of my favorite uh, war theorists, and that is Sun Tzu, said that uh, know yourself and know your enemy. And then in 100 battles or 1,000 battles, you will not be defeated. I'm not going to use the uh, so strong words as an enemy. I'd rather see them opponent. I'd like to see them as a partner. That said, the new Russian doctrine is actually quite a, uh, outspoken, and it's, it's quite clear. They perceive NATO and the United States in particular as an enemy. But uh, when we make a strategies, what, what the, the common mistake, what the West does, or the, uh, uh, what we do, is that we are using the same standards. We are sort of a not stepping on their shoes. We are sort of assuming that they use exactly the same values as we do. Unfortunately, it's not true. Their value set is based on uh, different experience. The way they, 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 they values the society is built differently. The, uh, when I tried to understand that, I interviewed one of the, um, uh, and that is a great uh, thinker, also an actor, and uh, he lives in Estonia. It's, he's actually descendant of a, a uh, Duke uh, Volkonsky. Uh, if you read the Lev Tolstoy book, uh, Peace and War, War and Peace, then there was a Duke uh, Volkonsky. He's actually descendant of that uh, aristocracy. And uh, he, what he explained that in Russia, there is a two eternal questions. Uh, the first one is who is guilty, and the second one is what to do. Uh, they found the, the answer to the first question, who is guilty? And that's literally always the others. The others are guilty. So. Even, and when I asked, uh, the, 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 the topic went on, and the, uh, I tried to understand that uh, after these long occupational years, why haven't they apologized? And he said, they don't even think that they are going to apologize. First of all, since they are not guilty, the others are guilty for the occupation, for the, uh, by the way, the, uh, the, the economic situation today, it's not uh, Putin is not guilty. It's the West is guilty. And that's continuously been represented to their society, to their domestic audience, that it's due to the West who does not understand the Russian way of living. They make the, uh, the, the hardship. They try to overthrow the, the Ukraine, and they made a secret revolution there color revolutions, and that's why the Russia has to suffer. But we'll come back to that later. So, who's guilty? And if, uh, if uh, we asked why haven't they apologized for their wrongdoings, he said that, but in the Russian language, that is, apologies is we need. Relieve me from my guilt, literally. But if I'm not guilty, why I, I should apologize. So this is the mentality and thinking. And the other question, what to do, they never found the question, uh, the, the answer to that, and they are literally looking for that, that all the time. But what is, the, uh, what is uh, certain, that this society goes, uh, uh, the, uh, they are affected by that post-imperial syndrome. <coughs> meaning that they want to be great. Greatness is in the core of the Russian people. They want to be great. And I will elaborate that greatness later. Definitely, the, uh, but if you think of the uh, uh, society post being a, one of the 
leader of the world in the Cold War times, suddenly you are reduced for almost nothing. Economically, Russia is at war. A militarily cannot match the same standards, not yet. Uh, apart from the uh, nuclear arm. So, if you see, uh, if you elaborate what I've already said, you can see that the uh, Samuel Huntington talking about the clash of civilization. Unfortunately, he was right. I hoped for some time that the uh, Francis uh, Fukuyama's uh, theory about the uh, end of the history, that we really got to that stage, but no, we haven't. It is a clash of civilizations. It is a, a different uh, mindset. It is a different way of thinking. Now, the, uh, I already alluded to that Russians they have a desire to be great. But it's the uh, bended. It's a wicked way of feeling being a great. Greatness in their society is something very masculine. They want to be feared. That's why they intimidate a rest of the world. They uh, if you take the American society, what's the greatness in the, 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 the way of America? It is democratic, ruling, a governance. It is the liberal freedoms. A person, an individual, is in the center of the, the society. It's a democracy. In Russia, unfortunately, the democracy is somewhat um, misinterpreted, misinterpreted. It is the uh, ruled or regulated uh, uh, democracy. In fact, it is autocratic ruling. It's not yet the, uh, it's not yet the, the absolute monarchy because it does not uh, match. However, if you see uh, what they are, uh, what they're doing, they are posing or they are representing Tsars who expanded a Russia as one of the greatest Tsars. And Mr. Putin actually had the same desire to be, to, to be a great leader and to, to, to go in history as one of the, the, the not, not the former Tsars, but one of the, the leaders who expanded who, or, and who restored the uh, empire. Of course, for the common people, you know, the, it is the uh, understandable. The, uh, again, the, uh, I already uh, mentioned that they want to be great. They want to be rulers of the world. But I will come back to that when we elaborate the, uh, uh, President Putin's role in, uh, in the society. So what is the political ideology now in Russia? <clears throat> Unfortunately, again, it is so far apart from our understandings of the uh, society. What they have taken, uh, and they even have announced, that there is no truth in the world. There are only many lies. And if you use a lie with that magnitude, that it becomes incognizable or intangible, then people refuse. It, it is a psychological effect that you, you can't even argue with that. Also, the, uh, bear in mind, if you see what they are talking about now, there is no such a thing as a love list in Russia. In Soviet times, it was the uh, Gagarin, for instance, a Lenin, some of the artists, they were like uh, rule models. You need to be like a, uh, uh, just uh, forget the, the, the name of that, 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 that uh, female uh, uh, astronaut. But they were rule models. There are no rule models anymore in Russia. That means that every ideolo ideology, what helps them or the uh, 
and now I'm talking about the political leadership, what helps them to achieve their goals is good. It is the, uh, the mentality. I try to find the, any example or any, any comparison to that mentality. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that only mentality close to that is the prison mentality. You have your own rules. You know, the, um, would you imagine that President Obama goes and rides with the Hell Angels, take the shirt off and tries the bike? <laughs> no, that's, that's not possible. But that's exactly what happens in Russia. That is unfortunately a real picture of that very much a masculine approach. So, and that's of course reflects to a, the foreign policy. What is their level of ambition? And if I elaborate in, in, in this uh, trinity, ends, ways, and means, Mr. Putin's goal is nothing else but to, be a, to become a world leader. A leader to take the leadership uh, away from the United States. Well, okay, he is probably, and I don't think that he is the, uh, uh, I think that he's a, quite a rational man. I think that he's a clever man. But he also realizes that it's rather impossible but that's a, and he may have a plan B, and that's a regional hegemony. And regional hegemony is literally restoring the empire or the Soviet empire. So the ways, how to make the ways. I, I would say that every, anyone who wants to have a, achieve their level of ambition need to have a good strategy. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Putin does not have a strategy, but he is very opportunistic. He looks and seeks for the uh, opportunities. Uh, you know that the Sunzi again the. Uh, uh, one of my favorite, as I already mentioned. Uh, fortunately, the Sun Tzu has laid down the, the principle for the strategy. And uh, as he says, that strategy without tactics is a long way to victory. Tactics without strategy is a way to disaster. And I'm afraid that uh, the great nation, and I, I, I truly uh, think that the Russia as a nation, is a great nation with a lot of achievements throughout the history, with a, with a great cultural background, deserves better governance. So the ways, controlled instability in their outer rim or in their neighborhood. But you know, the, uh, there is not such a, such a thing as the controlled instability. Instability is ne never, you never can control instability. That creates chaos, that creates a mayhem, that is the really a way to disaster. But from proximity, the, uh, since the, uh, you, you don't know, the, uh, we feel like uh, being on the frontier of the two civilizations. That it ha may have and it has direct influence to our society. May, very important for political leadership in Russia is to have a control of the domestic audience. That's why Putin is so afraid of these color revolutions. He wants to have a control. He ha wants to show the, uh, that he is the strong leader. And. Uh, if one asks whether the sanctions work, I would say, yes, they do. Will they reduce Putin's uh, popularity? Probably they will not. And one, one may ask how that come, but then you, you need to also understand that 
in Russian society, there are three classes. It is the oligarchs, uh, and they have the, the inner circle and outer circle of oligarchs. Then you have a middle class, and then you have a common people, and the common people are the majority. And if you really, due, uh, due to the sanctions, they will suffer. But then again, if they get 10 uh, rubles more or 10 rubles less, they don't feel the difference. <coughs> Oligars, of course, the inner circle, they already have suffered some losses. But there is already going on the redistribution of the wealth. Now, the most who is suffering are the middle class. But then again, they have no say in the current society. But you, interesting to see, and I, I mentioned you there before that there is a kind of a like a prison mentality. If one introduces a bill to their parliament asking that due to the uh, Western uh, sanctions, and remember the West is always guilty one, due to the Western sanctions, the state should compensate the losses of these inner oligarchs. It's literally legalizing a, a, a stealing from their own people. So it is their business risk. But no, but, uh, but I, I admit, I, uh, I didn't follow up whether that bill passed or not. But anyway, to even to introduce such a bill is strange to our thinking. Another, what is political leadership is trying to do? The ones who are guilty, the West, they still need them. But uh, solidarity has proven to be one of their obstacles. That, now the, the, uh, what they're trying to do, they're trying to, to split EU and they're trying to split NATO, trying to have a bilateral agreement bilateral discussions, and they try to have them on their terms. Luckily, so far, the EU solidarity and, uh, and NATO solidarity has proven to be a very solid indeed. Now, yet Putin as a person, as a strong leader, has to show progress. Now, the uh, the problem for us, uh, for the Western societies, is that that progress comes on the cost of something. The progress, yeah, uh, uh, and again, coming back to the Sun Tzu, uh, he always said that, you know, you need to leave a door open for your enemy. And West has tried to leave the door open on every each and every level. But the problem with that, that Mr. Putin has closed these doors on his own. So he literally has no other ways but to, 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 to go on in Ukraine to suppress or intimidate Georgia and to threaten NATO and the close neighborhood. Now, coming to the means, you know, the uh, means is, I already uh, alluded to, that is the uh, using a uh, nature or the weakness of a alliances. Because 28 countries in the EU, they all have their own interests, sometimes contradicting each other. That is his way to really split that unity. Energy is one of his means. But then again, energy is not <coughs> what was the miscalculation of Mr. Putin is that energy is a two-bladed sword. Turns out that interdependency, that the uh, Russia is more dependent on uh, European 
money than their Europe is on, uh, on the Russian gas. And military. That's really what he puts his efforts on. And quite frankly, uh, the, uh, what he has achieved uh, with their military is quite impressive. By all means, uh, the, the Russian military does not meet the very same standards as the NATO ones, particularly the U United States military. However, the, uh, uh, their, their reforms, what they have carried out, are impressive. We, by all means, their military might should not be underestimated. They are well motivated, uh, relatively well equipped, and they are putting more and more resources into their military. But again, it creates instability within Russia because their social programs are underfunded. <coughs> Their economy is in under, uh, or the in industry is undermined, underfunded. And now they only putting money in a military industry does not provide effect. In many ways, the uh, uh, Russia and its society and its, its economy can be described as one of the prime examples of the touch disease. Energy sector is prospering, not anymore, by the way. Yeah, because they don't have. But the other sectors, other other industries, are really uh, they they cannot compete with <coughs> the West. Uh, doctrine. Interesting reading. There are ideologies of Mr. Dugin, who is writing geopolitics of Russia. And here I suddenly also realized what a two different worlds we live in. We are in a 21st century that is more or less uh, uh, market economies or the market societies where individual is important. Mr. Tugin has returned back to the 19th century. So the ideology that the society is led by 19th century ideology. Now the, uh, and how to implement that ideology, these geopolitical uh, ambitions, a uh, military uh, doctrine, also can be called the Gerasimov doctrine, that is the chief of, uh, chief of staff, General Gerasimov, that's interesting reading too. And what he says, what the, uh, uh, what the foundation for that, that doctrine is that the Russian society lives in a constant war situation. Then, then can be more intensive periods, and there can be calm periods. But every clash of interest will lead to a violent conflict. That is a foundation of that doctrine. And we are talking about the, uh, also the hybrid warfare. And that is the uh, using a uh, power tools or the, uh, uh, the the combination or configuration of the power tools. Uh, by the way, it's it's a dime. It's a diploma, diplomacy, uh, information, uh, military, and uh, economy. And again, the uh, so far what they did in Ukraine was quite impressive. They used that very skillfully. What the doctrine says also that they don't want to use a hard power. It's rather a quick strikes, fix it, and use the other means, uh, as the uh, other state power tools for implementing their goals. But the, at the end of the day, they always say there is going to be some sort of a, a military or violent clash. And it's widely available, by the way. This is the, uh, uh, I didn't reveal any secrets. It is on the webs, uh, website and uh, uh, published. Uh, these doctrines uh, are published. And I'm not going to talk about Ukraine, yeah, uh, Ukraine, because the, uh, 
Yeah, we, we need to understand Ukraine has a difficult situation, but we also need to realize that Ukraine was and still is quite a corrupt country. However, the developments in Ukraine are enormous. So I'm staying very positive, very optimistic that the birth of Ukrainian nation has, 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 has occurred. But now coming back to a leader, Putin. When elaborating Putin, one need to also understand or realize what his background is. He was a former KGB officer, lieutenant colonel, not such an important position. But however, he believed in that system. He believed that the system created by the KGB is good, it's workable. He only then, when he was uh, in active duty, said, uh, said that it was led by the morons. The uh, leaders were idiots. But now, once he is in the power, he still believes in that system. And he tries to recreate that system on a wider magnitude, actually expanding to all over the, uh, his society. He's very authoritarian because he has all the power, to power tools in his pocket. He is opportunistic. He's a sinister. But really, whether he's irrational or irrational, we cannot tell. Because one cannot see into uh, an individual head. And what does that mean, rationality or irrationality anyway? What seems to us irrational may as well be irrational in his terms. And he has, definitely he has some personal goals. His system, the world he was living, literally collapsed. He is angry about that. And particularly, he is <coughs> seeking for revenge. He's seeking for revenge. What does that mean, revenge? He wants to intimidate his neighbors because he wants also to be a, uh, felt like a great leader. He definitely wants to humiliate the uh, United States because he felt great personal humiliation when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. That's one of his ends is to dismiss NATO. But again, how far can he go? Has he lost the sense of reality? I don't know. Uh, I'd rather say that uh, I hope, and uh, looking at him, I believe, still, still believe that the rational part of him is still uh, the, the leading part. But he is looking for a, to achieve the goals and to go in history as one of the greatest leaders in Russia. Now, before I go on, uh, uh, and but that that that's about the man. That is the uh, he is the authoritarian leader. That's the strength and weakness of the Russian society. If you see what the strength is, he has literally have monopolized the decisive power. If you see the in Ukraine, it took 48 hours from the political decision to the uh, real action on the ground. That is sort of a advantage. Disadvantage is it does not serve society. And the authoritarian regimes, they, if they are clash, the, uh, the, throughout the history, the authoritarian regimes, if they clash with democratic societies, they always lose. But what is going to be the uh, cost of that clash? Now the before I end my presentation and uh, give opportunities, the, the, 
uh, you to to ask questions. I would like to 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 elaborate a bit of the uh, position of China, because in a global power games, you never can uh, avoid talking about the China, and the uh, China's position in respect, or, or in in retrospect of the, the Russian foreign policy. China is interesting. The uh, 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 Putin has announced that they don't need West. They do business with China. But however, the, the uh, uh, economic agreement that they, they reached was signed under the Chinese terms. Simple as that. China is one of the strongest powers in the world. Demography is not in support as, as well. But, but if you just, if you take a, a map of China, just imagine the map of China, what, what is China? China is a lot of people, no resources. Take the south of China, the country south of China, what is that? I Many a lot of people, no resources. No. South. No. And uh, uh, north of China, many resources, no people. Yeah. That's simple as that. Where the Chinese interests are, one can actually, uh, one can, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but uh, everybody can uh, uh, prognose it on, on their own. So the uh, Chinese position is rather interesting, but uh, from a global uh, poli uh, political uh, perspective, one can also say that in a cl uh, Cold War, Russia used China as a, the, 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 the uh, swing uh, partner uh, against the United States. The same can happen now that the China can start uh, using a Russia's voice in order to get its own foreign policy goals through. But anyway, uh, BRICS countries, the, uh, Russia tried to be a spokesperson for the BRICS countries. Let's analyze. Brazil. And China, by, by, by all means, uh, well, the, the Russia, by all means, is the weakest economy in that block. Why should uh, Brazil ask for the spokesperson? Uh, First of all, they have a uh, cultural ties with Western Europe and North America. <coughs> Their economies are not linked. Doesn't need any spokesperson. China, I already talked about that. They don't need a spokesperson either. Or, uh, India. India is one of the uh, another nation with a huge potential. India has a very close links with Anglo-Saxon, with the British Empire. India has the cultural ties and economic ties with the uh, West. So I can't see any, any, any perspective for the Russians taking a lead in that block. Well, I came almost to an end to my uh, uh, presentation. But I, I, I would say that in regard to Russia, uh, in close proximity in our countries, we would rather see a prosperous nation, a stable nation, because also the instability, what they are creating can occur within their society. If that occurs, what are the consequences? No one can tell. Uh, but it definitely has a spillover effect. So that's why in, uh, their, in, in the close neighborhood, everybody hopes for the stable, democratic, and prosperous neighbor. And I will end here with my presentation, and uh, I'm open for the questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Do you feel comfortable standing for the oh, question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Great. All right, we have a few minutes um, for questions. If you could please um, raise your hand, I'd identify yourself and your affiliation, if you have one. Um, yes, sir, over here. Hi, uh, uh, Pat Spann, just myself. And um, I seem to remember that in uh, starting in the uh, in the 40s, there was a lot of uh, Russian immigrants into Estonia and the other Baltic states. And I was just curious um, what the percentage of the population now, and also do the, those immigrants in the couple generations after them, do they con are they um, assimilating? Do they consider themselves Estonians? It's a good question. But uh, you know, the, uh, some of them, uh, uh, and we need, to, we need to really be more precise about the Russian population. We need to say that they are Russian-speaking population. For instance, we have a, quite a uh, large diaspora of Ukrainians living in, in Estonia. They are Russian-speaking. And uh, from the other, other, other Soviet uh, Union uh, republics, there are other representatives as well. But uh, most of them, they're very loyal to Estonia. And the percentage is approximately 25%. Uh, particularly the ones who came uh, before the Second World War to, to uh, independent Estonia, they are Estonians. And uh, even the Ukrainians, we call them Esto Ukrainians. We don't want them to assimilate into our society. We want them to integrate into our society. Because we don't want them to lose their national identity. Because the, uh, by the way, a lot of these problems we have ISIS today, uh, the, the recruiting uh, a, uh, youngsters from a, uh, Western societies, the ISIS, I, I mean in Syria, the uh, Islamic uh, radicals, why they have been so successful? Because these youngsters, they have lost their identity. They have not assimilated or integrated into the new society, and they don't have roots anymore. They don't feel their roots anymore in their home country, or the country of origin, not their home country, the home country where they are living. We, we'd rather avoid that. We, we want them to, uh, to create their own identity within our society. And I'd rather say it's, it's quite a, um, uh, the process has been quite successful. Um, they are, and the, the best guarantee is the proximity of Russia as well. They travel a lot to Russia. The living standards in Estonia are so much higher than in Russia. So that's from the economical point of view. The weakness is, they live in their media uh, environment. The Russian media is overwhelming them. So there are, of course, and there were Estonia and the Estonian government has to do more to introduce the um, Estonian uh, Russian-speaking media, expand it, and uh, and to tell the uh, the, uh, the 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 other other side of the coin. Otherwise, they will be influenced a lot by the Russian propaganda. And the Russian propaganda is very strong. And, and uh, whether it's successful in the long term, it is not. But it has the immediate effects, uh, undesired effects. Yes, sir, in the middle. There's a microphone in for you. Gerald Chandler. Could you go back over the history of NATO with Estonia? How many people in Estonia wanted to join NATO? How much, what kind of arguments were there? And now that you're in Estonia, uh, how many people think it was a good idea? How many people are worried that NATO won't stand up for Estonia? That's another great question. The, uh, when we tried to join, it was approximately over 80% of the Estonian society's support on that. Citizens. I, I need to emphasize citizens. And uh, now the uh, uh, percentage has grown because to the, uh, the, the, the threat perception and the, uh, the security situation uh, with 90% or so, four. 93. 
93 percent. Just came, came out yeah. two days ago. Yeah. But what's, what's interesting that the uh, Russian-speaking diaspora is also four. So the, uh, but the, 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 the vote there is somewhat less, the uh, uh, 60 to 40, uh, 64 NATO and uh, I forgot the, the other part of the question. Your the other part of the question was, what do people think now? Was it a good decision? And actually, I want to add on <coughs> to that. There are some people in the United States who said it was a bad idea to add. Okay, I'll repeat my question. The second part of the question was, what do people now <coughs> say? I, the first part was, what did they think then? What did they think now? And we've just got the answer that is 93% now. And, but I want to add on to my question. There are some people who said 20 years ago or 15 years ago it in the United States, it was a very bad idea to extend NATO to the Baltic republics. What do you individually say and what does the uh, government say uh, in reply to the people who say it was a bad idea? Everybody has a right to their own opinion, of course. But uh, was that a bad idea? That creates stability. If, uh, if, if Putin was in opinion that Article 5 does not work, he would have already invaded Estonia. There is no question about that. He will not, because now he is hesitant. He'd rather, he, I believe that he is certain that uh, the Article 5 works. Unfortunately, the NATO Treaty Organization or the Alliance, uh, or th that treaty is sometimes uh, misinterpreted as well. Everybody talks about Article 5, but there are many other articles. It's Article 4, it's the consultations. But for Estonia, the main article is Article 3, what says and states, each and every nation is responsible for their own defense. And that's what we are trying to do. That is the emphasis of the Defense League, Estonian Defense Forces, and Estonia as such. So that's why we are uh, paying 2% of the GDP. That's why we are strengthening the, uh, uh, and doing, uh, we've been allied, we've been to a countries fighting the, uh, the, the NATO, uh, NATO wars in Afghanistan, a country far away from Estonia. And one also need to remember that Afghanistan is somewhat contradictory to Estonia. In this conflict, we lost, how many was that, Kairi? Nine persons. But you need to remember that in the Soviet Union, we lost 39 Estonians there. So it's not the first time we're in Afghanistan. First time we were for the wrong reasons. This time we for the uh, unity, for the uh, solidarity. And uh, being in NATO, I'd rather see that we have extended the, the uh, stable and stability all over the world. But there are always people who are going to be a, uh, against that. Um, but that's pretty normal, isn't it? Yes, sir. Hi, Carl Golovin, JFKVigil.com. My question is about two concepts, one monetary and one the term false flag terrorism. Um, in history, well, Sun Tzu probably would have advocated the concept of false flag terrorism, that an entity can uh, precipitate a attack or disaster and then blame it on a preferred enemy that may not have actually caused it. Who has more to fear, Russia, the NATO entities who were involved in Operation Gladio, apparently the false flag, or the false flag bombing of the Bologna train station in 1980 that was blamed on communists, but allegedly, and I think it's established, was precipitated by NATO stay-behind forces in Italy. Uh, does Russia have more to be concerned about Western <laughs> false flag terrorism or the West about Russian false flag terrorism? And might not a path to peace be going back to Bretton Woods and restoring a stable international monetary system? That's a good question. I'd rather ask the, uh, you, you another question. Who started the, uh, the um, or how the second Chechen war started? I don't know. Yeah, we do. Russian special forces, or the, the uh, special uh, forces blew up a uh, 
house with 300 their own inhabitants. How did the uh, winter war in 1939 start? Uh, Russians shot the first shots on their own troops, uh, accusing uh, Finns. So, unfortunately, these tricks are played. But Sun Tzu also said that uh, the best victory achieved is the victory without battles. That's what I think that based on, on our value system, we need to, we need to really a, deter, avoid a violent conflict, be a, an example, be a real model, because the values are not elastic. Values has to stay on a solid ground for our own people and for our adversary as well. So the, that's the best I can answer to your question. We have time for one final question. The gentleman over here um, to my right. Thank you, General, for your outstanding presentation. Um, I'm Nikolai Vorobyov. I'm Ukrainian journalist, and I'm quite familiar with the situation because I spent on the ground around like two months in eastern Ukraine. And thanks to Heritage Foundation, I hold my speech here a month ago. So. Uh, my question, I have like two short questions about like the situation in your country. Can you please uh, um, focus, like tell us more about your defense league? I mean, do, uh, well, what measures do you take to defeat like Russians in case if they intervene right now? So, I mean, maybe you just get more support from NATO or just send more like troops on the border. And the, th the second question, how do you cooperate with Ukrainians? Do you take their experience from Eastern Ukraine? What, uh, what uh, kind of weapons do Russians use? And if they will decide to intervene in Baltic states, so wh 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 what kind of weapon and just like how to deal with this? And the third question is like really short about what you will do with little green men in case if you will see in them on the street of Estonia. Thank you. Well, I start with the second question. Of course we do have a cooperation with the Ukrainians. Of course we try to uh, utilize the, uh, the lessons identified, tactics, what they use. And uh, in return, we, we try to support them uh, uh, on a political level as well as on a military level. Because the uh, one thing is certain that this, this Estonian society is very sympathetic with the uh, suffering uh, Ukrainian society. But uh, really, you are doing great. Uh, the uh, how the nation is pulling together, how the uh, volunteers uh, standing against a highly professional regulars, and they are Russian soldiers. The uh, we don't have to fool ourselves. They are regular Russian soldiers. What the Ukraine is fighting now with. Uh, first question is. And I will come back to the, the third question because that's linked with the first question. <coughs> Estonia Defence League is the first responder. That's meaning that Estonia Defence League members are all over the country. Uh, they are high readiness because we have our weapons at uh, at home, we have a, our equipment at home, and uh, we are represented each and every county. So, and the interest of joining the uh, Defense League has also increased. They are the patriots who are willing to do their duty. In our constitution, it says that it is obligation of every person to defend its own country. But we have extended it a bit and uh, uh, modified it for our Defense League. We are saying that it is our right to defend our country. So it is based on a patriotism, what is in combination with a good training, <coughs> high morale, and motivation, and we are the first responders. So it is the uh, really, uh, wherever it, uh, it strikes. What to do with the green little man? Who are they? In legal terms, who are they? Are they competent, without insignia, armed people? 
they're literally terrorists. And they have to be dealt accordingly. But Defense League works together also, not in only with the military, but it's with the law enforcement as well. So the law enforcement, Defense League, entire society has to react on that. If they occur, and if they are fighting, we fight back. We eliminate them. Or it is preferred to arrest them and take to them, them to the court. But they has to be <coughs> dealt like a terrorist, what they are, really are. Simple as that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's that's about it. Um, thank you, General, for such a comprehensive overview of the situation in Eastern Europe, and um, especially with your country. And I think it, it benefits um, an American audience to hear a perspective from, from our friends and allies. So th thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Brigadier General. Thank you. Uh, th this presentation will be available online at heritage.org in about 24 hours, I think. So um, if you want to recap or whatever, you can find it there. Thanks for coming.